welcome to another musical adventure. And this video is a response to a video that I saw by James Griffiths. Uh, give me five producers. And I believe his video was a response to Richard McCook, uh, who I believe started the, the thread on five producers. And James brought up some really, really good names. Uh, George Martin, Chris Thomas, Thomas Dolby, and just some, some guys that were fascinating. So I highly recommend you check out their videos on Give Me Five. And I thought of five producers almost immediately. And it's five names that when I see them attached to a record or attached to a project, I tend to um, kind of gravitate toward those records, and I enjoy them. Uh, and the first one that came to my mind that just popped right out was this guy right here. And for those of you who don't know, that's Jeff Lynn. This was uh, his first band, The Idle Race. The, he later joined The Move with Roy Wood, and Roy Wood uh, and Jeff eventually went on to... Uh, plant the seeds of what became the Electric Light Orchestra. Of course, this is Out of the Blue, probably one of their biggest albums commercially. But uh, ELO, uh, a commercial juggernaut in the in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, and, of course, Jeff kind of became known uh, later on, in addition to writing these sort of great pop songs and, and producing them, Jeff worked with a lot of other artists, from, from Dave Edmonds, of course, notably Tom Petty, uh, the Full Moon Fever album, uh, which is which is widely regarded as one of his best albums, um, Jeff was involved with. Uh, of course, Jeff kind of became friends with all those guys. There he is again, uh, and there's Tom Petty next to him. Uh, Roy Orbison's You Got It, which was a big comeback single for him. Uh, Jeff Lynn was involved in that. And, of course, uh, also one of the other Wilburys that Jeff was involved with, Mr. George Harrison. And, of course, this is his album, Cloud Nine which was a huge commercial success. Uh, so Jeff kind of had his hands in quite a few pots, uh, and, and a lot of them were, were very successful. And so Jeff has a very distinct sound, and, and some people don't care for it, the big uh, drums and the phased vocals. I myself am a huge fan of that, uh, but it's very specific, and it's very sort of signature for Jeff Lynn. And I always point to the two Beatles reunion tracks from the mid-'90s from the Anthology Projects, uh, as sort of a great sort of moment um, for for Jeff as well, because I heard those original Lennon demos, little cassettes, and they were they're absolutely horrible. And I think Jeff did just sonic wonders with with those particular tracks. Um, there's differing opinions on it, and I understand why people wouldn't like Jeff, but I'm I'm just a sucker for that for that sound. I, I love it, and um, would love to work with Jeff. Uh, just to just to see how he how he gets that sound. And plus, he just seems like a nice guy. I mean, every interview and every time I see him, he just comes across as very humble and just a sweet sweet man. But uh, Jeff Lynn's my my first one. Uh, another producer that came to my mind is uh, Dave Cobb. Uh, Dave Cobb, and this is probably one of an album that he's most known for, Jason Isbell's Southeastern from 2013. Dave Cobb, now the story on this is that uh, Isbell was supposed to work with um, Ryan Adams uh, for this record, and he ended up teaming up with Dave Cobb. Dave Cobb's a Nashville guy, and uh, has worked with Dave ever since. Every, every Isbell record that's come out since this one uh, has, been, has Dave Cobb's uh, fingerprints all over it. As a matter of fact, I think Dave Cobb has remixed some of uh, Isbell's earlier records, and, and, and they've been reissued uh, since then. Uh, so they kind of, I think, I think Isbell and Dave Cobb have a very good working relationship, obviously. Um, another album that, that Cobb is, is known for probably is Sturgill Simpson's Meta Modern Sounds in Country Music. Now he's not really, I would call him, I wouldn't call him a country guy, but I mean the fact that he's in Nashville and he works with these sort of, uh, country related artists, maybe, maybe pigeonholes him a little bit. One of the things I like about Dave Cobb and, and the records that I've heard him involved in, it's a very natural sounding record, like the guitars sound like they're, they're right there in the room with you. Um, there's not a whole lot of uh, stuff, unlike Jeff Lynn, where, where it's all over like I'm producing this and there's a very produced sound. I think think Lanois has more of a uh, I'm not Lanois, uh, Dave Cobb has more of a uh, just a, a very earthy kind of very very natural sound which which I enjoy and that kind of comes to my next guy uh, James Luther Dickinson Jim Dickinson as he's known he's a Memphis guy uh, worked out of the zebra branch and uh, zebra ranch in North Mississippi I'm sorry I can't talk today um, and so this is his solo album Dixie Fried from the early 70s on Atlantic Records but uh, Dickinson is sort of a, a great sort of Memphis historian of course he passed away a few years back 
but uh, was well known. I think he sort of carried on the flame of Sam Phillips. Huh? Sam Phillips famously kind of said that if, if you know, if, if I'm recording a song and there's a phone that rings in the background or a guitar that's slightly out of tune, if there's a feeling there, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep those mistakes. And it's a very rock and roll approach to, to recording. And Dickinson kind of had that, that same philosophy, I believe, in the Big Star documentary. And, and that's who Dickinson is most, most associated with as a producer, Big Star's third, uh, and working with, with Alex Chilton and being around that, that gang um, during that time in the mid-70s in Memphis. But um, in the Big Star documentary, Nothing Can Hurt Me, uh, I think someone mentions, maybe it's Dickinson's widow, Mary Lindsay, mentions that the producer's name is the smallest name on the record. And so Dickinson had this sort of, I'm going to stay out of the way approach to, to production. He didn't try to put a lot of himself in there. He wanted the artist to sort of be the star of the show. And another Dickinson record that, that I'm fond of is The Replacements, Please to Meet Me. Uh, I just think this is a fantastic record. Uh, and again, very different sounding. Dickinson worked with different different people. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about Dickinson, if you're familiar with the Rolling Stones uh, documentary, Gimme Shelter, there's the scene where they're at Muscle Shoals recording Wild Horses and they're listening to a playback. And there's, there's this shot of Keith Richards with his snakeskin boots. He's sitting next to Jim Dickinson who played piano on that track. Uh, and there is Jim on the back cover here. If you can see that working with the replacements but uh there's a reason the replacements wanted to work with him it was the association with alex but uh jim was just an overall great storyteller he was a, a great historian and particularly memphis music i think some of the blues artists like furry lewis uh had a had a later revival because jim jim kind of kind of brought their careers back uh and i'm going to talk about jim a little more in a second because it leads into the next guy and i kind of alluded to his name earlier and that's daniel lanois Daniel Lanois um, is an artist and producer. This is one of his bigger albums, uh, So by Peter Gabriel. Now, Lanois has a very sort of distinct sound. It's very uh, atmospheric. It's very ethereal almost. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a very almost specific sound that, that he has on his records. And, and some of the ones that I've, I've got to mention, of course, Bob Dylan, Oh Mercy. By the mid-'80s, Bob had sort of his career was sort of waffling. He was doing some very middle of the road or less than middle of the road albums. And this was in 89, this was considered a, a big comeback for Dylan uh, because A, the quality of songs, but, but the production that Lanois lent to this. Now, if you've read Chronicles, the Dylan autobiography, he talks a little bit about, a little bit about making this in New Orleans um, in this big mansion. And Lanois, like I said, is, is atmospheric is the word I would use. And, uh, and just a, just a, Kind of a, a unique producer in that regard. Another album Lanois was associated with was Time Out of Mind, which was another comeback for Dylan in the, in the mid-90s, uh, 97. Uh, and so this, this was considered a, a huge record. It, it won Grammy for Album of the Year. And uh, it does have that Lanois sort of um, echoey sound. A couple of other records worth mentioning that Lanois was involved in. Uh, Willie Nelson's Teatro album, which came out shortly after this. One of Willie's better solo albums, I think. And uh, I'm also thinking of Neil Young's La Noise, which was a play on, on the Lanois name. Uh, La Noise uh, was just Neil and, and just a sonic uh, album because it's just Neil and a guitar uh, and recorded in a big, big house and just, you know, he let the guitars just make a lot of racket, which I'm a big fan of. But uh, I bring up Time Out of Mind as well because uh, our buddy Jim Dickinson actually played piano on a couple of the tracks here. I want to say he played guitar, uh, played piano on... Um, on Lovesick, um, he, he played on actually quite a few of these songs, um, but uh, he played a Wurlitzer organ, uh, keyboards, electric piano, pump organ, um, so, so you hear Dickinson on this album, so he's kind of associated with that to bring it back. And finally, the fifth producer that I want to talk about is just a name that when I see his name on a record, I kind of smile and I enjoy the records he's done, is uh, Mike Chapman, who is an Australian. Uh, and of course, I think most famously, he did uh, produce Blondie's Parallel Lines. He was very closely associated with a lot of um, pop records in the late 70s and, and early 80s, quite a few hits, uh, most notably working with Blondie. Uh, but I like his production because it's very... Um, because I'm a, I'm a fan of that kind of music, but I think it's just that punchy, just quick, um, bright kind of sounding sounding music. And of course, the other record that I think Mike Chapman was involved in that I happen to love is "Get the Knack" by the Knack, 
just a just a great record. Um, and like I said, Mike Chapman, he, you know, when I see his name on a record, I think it's think it's a good record. And finally, the one thing I want to kind of close this video with, uh, just to make a two for one here, is a um, little mail call um, that recently I, I took advantage of the spring cleaning sale from Light in the Attic. Light in the Attic, uh, of course, is the label that, that handles a lot of my or they've handled all of my Lee Hazelwood reissues that, uh, that I've talked about quite a bit on this channel. But um, I went through and kind of looked at the titles they had on their, their spring cleaning, and I sampled some of them and ordered them. So some of these are blind buys. Uh, this one, not so much. This is a little 45. It's a single uh, celebrating Light in the Attic's 10th anniversary, and it's Gold Leaves doing a Lee Hazelwood song doing uh, Won't You Tell Me Your Dreams. Of course, it's on that great marble vinyl. On one side is Gold Leaves, on the other side is Lee's version of the song. Um, and it was only like two bucks, and so I thought, you know, for, for two dollars you, you can't go wrong, and especially for me with Lee, and there's Lee's photo on the back of the record. Let me get that in there for you. So, anyway, for for cheap price, I thought that's that's one worth having. Another one actually isn't on the Light in the Attic label, but it's uh, one of their subsidiaries, uh, Magic Bus Entertainment. This is the Perth County Conspiracy. And like I said, I sampled this uh, when I was going through the, the records. The cover kind of grabbed me. And uh, it's, it's a Canadian folk rock band. Now, they do some interesting songs on here. Uh, specifically, um, If You Can Want by Smokey Robinson, uh, Hurdy Gurdy Man, the Donovan song, and uh, I Shall Be Released by Bob Dylan. And so, just it looked like a cool record. Looks like a looks like it'd be a good listen. And, and from the samples I heard online, I enjoyed it. So, um, so it's one that I thought for the price, why not? And finally, the last thing is this one. Now, this is on the light in the attic. This is um, Sing It High, Sing It Low, Tumbleweed Records, 1971 to 73. The story on this is that um, Larry Ray and Bill Schmizik, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Bill Schmizik is the record producer associated with the Eagles and sort of the later Eagle stuff. I think also worked on It's Hard by The Who. Um, they went to Denver and, and started a record label and worked with these, these different artists, and, and this is sort of a compilation of some of that stuff. Now, um, one of the, some of the names on there, Russ Conkle, I know, was involved. Um, let's see, um, Pete McCabe, uh, Ro I said Russ Conkle, Rob Conkle, apologies. Rob Conkle, uh, Danny Holian, and Astral Cowboy Arthur G., uh, Michael Stanley is another name, but uh, I just like the samples I heard of this online, and so I think it's a record I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy quite a bit. So I uh, wanted to share it with you. Uh, Tumbleweed Records, I guess, was like a country rock label that that was out there in Denver, Colorado, of all places. So uh, if I mispronounced Bill Schmizik's name, I, I do apologize, or any other names I may have butchered here. Uh, comment down below, let me know. And if you have a response to this, give me five producers. Um, go ahead and do that and put your link down there in the comment section. As always, I love interacting with you guys. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. It doesn't cost you anything to subscribe, so just go ahead and do it. And if you're also so inclined, ring that bell to get notified when there's new content that is uploaded. Uh, like I said, I love interacting with you guys. Hopefully the next video is going to be a full-blown adventure. We'll keep our fingers crossed that that's the case. Uh, and so in the meantime, I'm going to remind you all to save the Texas Prairie Chicken. Goodbye.